Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Josh Levitt and I am excited that you have decided to join me here on What's Your Medicine, my new show where we define medicine in the broadest possible way. So these days, when most people think about medicine, they think of doctors, surgeons, hospitals, pharmacies, and prescriptions for medication. Now, this might surprise you, but as a naturopathic doctor, I actually agree. Drugs and surgery are medicine for sure, but, and it's a big but, medicine can be and should be much, much more than that. Food is medicine, herbs are medicine, movement is medicine, prayer is medicine, art, music, storytelling. There is medicine everywhere if you open yourself up to finding it. So on this show, I will be talking to experts in every one of those areas, the physicians, the surgeons, the scientists, but also the artists, the dreamers, the healers. I'll be talking to them about their medicine with the ultimate goal of helping you find yours. But today, for this first episode, it's just me here in the studio to give you a sense of me and my medicine and maybe more importantly, what it can do for you. We're gonna jump right into all of it in just a minute, but before I do, I wanna remind you to text the letters P O D to 51472 to join the What's Your Medicine community. You'll get early access to new episodes, live Q and A's with me. We've got some amazing member giveaways and all sorts of great stuff for you. So text P as in podcast, O D as in dog to 51472 right now to get on that list. What's Your Medicine is brought to you by Up Wellness. Now, for most people, the word medicine means pills from a pharmacy. And sure, they are medicine. But as you are going to hear on today's show, medicine can be, medicine should be much, much more than that. And the good people at Up Wellness, well, they understand that. Of course, as the person who formulated their products, I'm a little bit biased, but the Up Wellness lineup of nutritional and herbal supplements are my first line go-to medicines, and I think that they should be yours too. And What's Your Medicine listeners can get a full 30% off anything you buy at upwellness.com by using the code WYM at checkout. That's WYM, which stands for What's Your Medicine at checkout, for a full 30% off any purchase at upwellness.com. Today's solo episode of What's Your Medicine is all about joint pain and how to get rid of it, which has been a primary interest of mine in my practice for over 25 years now. So there's lots of terms that you might see in your own medical record. Arthritis, osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease, degenerative discs, bulging or herniated discs, joint space narrowing, cartilage thinning, bone spurs, spondylosis, stenosis, and of course, those infamous words, bone on bone. So if any of that yucky stuff sounds familiar, stick around, because today I'm gonna talk to you about my own experience treating people in pain, and I'm gonna teach you a framework for how you can safely, effectively, and reliably get rid of your pain using different medicine, not the typical drugs and surgery that are the foundations of modern medicine. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that drugs and surgery are inherently bad. They are just the conventional or the mainstream ways to approach these problems. They're what I consider high level interventions. They're expensive. They have lots of potential toxicity and side effects. And I think if they can be avoided, I think they should be. And as the theme of this this show suggests, there are lots of other medicines out there, lots of other ways to understand and to treat painful musculoskeletal or orthopedic conditions. And one of the reasons why this is just so important is because of how big this problem really is. The American Academy of Orthopedic Physicians, they put out a report that says that 127 million American adults suffer from arthritis or musculoskeletal pain. That's almost one in every two people. This is a huge problem. But if you see a conventional doctor for musculoskeletal pain, and millions of you do, 
you're likely to get nothing more than a recommendation for a drug like aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, naproxen, or a stronger and even more dangerous prescription anti-inflammatory medication. And the latest research into this shows that taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for acute pain can actually increase the risk of chronic pain. And that's because it turns off the immune responses that are crucial for recovery. And then even worse than those NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, particularly if your pain is chronic, are the prescriptions for opiates like oxycodone and others with more than 150 million opiate prescriptions written every year. And tragically, a lot of those prescriptions are the very spark that lights that fire of this nationwide epidemic that we have of prescription drug addiction and overdoses. Now, the bottom line here is that those pills are just not an ideal solution for joint pain. Far from it. And one of the main problems with that approach is that it does not treat the real underlying causes of the pain. And there is always an underlying cause. And if you don't identify and then treat that real cause, you can't produce real reliable relief from the pain. And that is what this episode is all about today. And I'm going to present it and explain the four most common underlying causes of pain. And we're going to go through them one by one in detail. But before I tell you about those four underlying causes. I want to tell you a short story because it's really going to frame all of this for you really well. And if you're here watching or listening to this episode, I am pretty sure that in many ways, this is your story as well. So here it goes. So a man, he limps into his orthopedist office. He's concerned because he has pain in the ball of his foot. So the doctor examines the foot and he makes a diagnosis. You've got a case of metatarsalgia. That's the diagnosis. And the guy's scared, right? It sounds bad. But this diagnosis is nowhere near as bad as it might sound because the metatarsals are the bones in the ball of the foot. And algia, A-L-G-I-A, it just means pain in Latin. So metatarsalgia is just a fancy medical way of saying pain in the metatarsals. This doctor may as well have just said the pain in your foot is caused by pain in the foot syndrome. It's really ridiculous. And there are hundreds of such terms that describe painful musculoskeletal conditions like that. Arthritis for pain in the joints. Neuropathy for pain in the nerves. Sciatica for pain down the sciatic nerve. And then considering that there are 200 bones, 600 muscles, thousands of ligaments and tendons, the list of painful syndromes just goes on and on and on. And these diagnoses, the names of them, just that describe the symptom or restate the problem in medical terminology, it's not, it's really, it's not an insight into the problem and its cause. It's just data for the medical industry, the insurance companies, and big pharma. And it may be useful to them, but just naming something for what it is is not really useful to you. So in conventional orthopedic medicine, the process of making that diagnosis, putting the name to the problem, it's really essential because when a patient's complaint becomes a formal diagnosis, a menu of treatment options becomes available. And for most problems in orthopedic or musculoskeletal medicine, that medical menu, it includes referrals for physical therapy, drugs, injections, and surgery. And although that menu of options might do a fine job of treating the symptom of the problem, rarely do those options address the root cause that led to the development of that problem in the first place. And when it comes to arthritis or really any chronic musculoskeletal pain, knee pain, back pain, foot pain, any of that, the diagnosis or the name of the problem almost never explains why the problem or the pain really exists. And it's not even just that. Doctors often don't just identify the underlying causes of pain. It's worse. They frequently misidentify the cause of the pain and then implement useless and sometimes harmful and dangerous treatments. And I have another short story for you. This one about a patient of mine that illustrates this point so well. So this is about an 82-year-old woman. Her name is Lois. And when I first met her, I was supervising medical students at a university clinic. So Lois came in in a wheelchair pushed by her daughter because her neck 
was in so much pain. It was so severe that she couldn't even walk. And she told me that her pain had started three days before when she was getting out of bed. She had this terrible pain in her neck, but there was no obvious injury or any other trauma that triggered that pain. So we had an x-ray facility on the site. And so after this conversation that Lois and I had, I did a basic exam. We took a few x-rays of her spine. Now the radiologist put the images up on a screen and explained to the students, I was supervising students at the time, that this woman had severe cervical spondylosis. And that's a term that's used to describe all the changes that occur in arthritis in the spine, disc degeneration, bone spurs, facet arthritis, all of that. And I could see these medical students, they're connecting the dots. Cervical spondylosis equals pain, right? And that's right when I stepped in. And I reminded everyone that just minutes before we looked at these x-rays, Lois had told us that her neck had been hurting for three days. So I asked the students a simple question. What do you think that her x-rays would have looked like four days ago or five days ago when her neck felt fine? Now, the answer to this is obvious, right? Cervical spondylosis, like she had, takes years to develop. It doesn't happen overnight. Her x-rays probably look like that for years. In fact, there are dozens of studies that have used x-rays or MRI to look at the spines of thousands of people who are asymptomatic. This is people who have no pain and they've discovered evidence of cervical disc degeneration, just like Lois had, in over 80% of people over age 60 who have no pain. So the results of these studies should highlight a really huge problem that occurs in orthopedic offices every day. And that is that physicians regularly assume that a patient's pain is coming from the problem that they saw on the x-ray or the MRI. And more often than not, those doctors are wrong. And you can look at the Arthritis Foundation right there on the homepage of their website. It says that arthritis pain can come and go, which is true. Most of you who have arthritis have experienced that. So if you think about that for a minute, if your knees look bad on x-rays, you see evidence of arthritis there, how do you explain that you have good days and bad days? And the answer is that it's because what you're seeing on those x-rays is only part of the story. And the rest of that story is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So are you ready to get started with this? Let's jump right into it. So 99% of what you're going to hear from here on out is about you. It's not about me, but there is 1% of it that is about me. And that's where we're going to start. And the reason is that I'm going to take you on a journey. And it's an important journey because if you have pain, I think that you deserve to know, hopefully like, and hopefully trust the person who is giving you advice about how to fix it. And that is me. So Briefly, a little quick bio. I um, I grew up in Southern California, and because of my love for skateboarding and surfing and other fun ways to go really fast and break things, I actually broke a lot of things, sprains and strains and fractures. These were common childhood injuries in me. Casts and splints were like part of my wardrobe when I was growing up. And I think that's why I knew from an early age that I wanted to be an orthopedic or a sports medicine doctor. It just seemed like the perfect job for me. And when I saw my grandparents getting their knees and their hips replaced, I just thought this is the coolest thing ever. So after high school, I went to UCLA in Los Angeles. I got a bachelor's degree in human physiology. That was a pre-medical track. And during that time, this was more than 25 years ago now, I was able to observe and do internships with real orthopedists and sports medicine doctors, super busy clinics where every patient we saw was in some sort of musculoskeletal pain. And there in those clinics, I started to notice this pattern. And the pattern was that the patients always left with a prescription or a referral for something. Often it was for a drug. Sometimes it was for physical therapy or for an x-ray or an MRI or to come back for another appointment for an injection or even for a surgery. But here's the thing, those patients never left those appointments feeling any better. Now, right around this same time, I was becoming interested in what we used to call alternative medicine or holistic medicine. And there were a few practitioners of various of these types in that area in Los Angeles. So it, that included a few naturopathic doctors. So I figured out a way to go in and intern uh, and observe some of them as well. And that is when I had this aha moment that really changed the course of my life and my career. And it wasn't like like an aha moment that happened in an instant. It was more like a like a slow burn, like a realization about a different pattern than the one that I was seeing in those orthopedic clinics. 
So what it was was this. At the end of these holistic or naturopathic appointments, patients often actually felt better. They had less pain than when they walked in. They had more range of motion. They would often be stunned. They'd even laugh, and sometimes they would even cry right there in the office when they could twist or move or bend down without the pain that they had walked in with. And they would say thank you to the doctors. Thank you like they meant it, you know? Not like the thank you that an orthopedist would get when they handed a patient a little paper prescription to, you know, to bring to the pharmacy. This was like a real thank you, like coming from the heart. And I noticed that and I decided that I wanted that from my patients too. And now if you fast forward 25 years later, here I am now, I'm an experienced naturopathic physician. I have thankfully and gratefully received thousands of those kind of heartfelt thank yous from my patients and also from my readers, from my subscribers and my customers who are all people just like you, people who have had their lives disrupted by pain. Now, most of these people, they found me because they couldn't bear weight on their knee without feeling or hearing some kind of grinding pain. Some of them couldn't get out of a chair or out of bed without being you know, hunched over, clutching their low back. Lots of people who weren't able to open a jar or to tie their shoes or sit down on the toilet even without pain. So lots of these folks had been told that they needed drugs. Many of them had been told that they needed surgery. And of course, there were many of them who had already taken the drugs, already had the surgeries, and were still hurting and in pain. And in these last 25 years, I've continued to observe patterns in people with arthritis and joint pain, how they look, how they feel, how they move, what their x-rays and their MRIs actually look like, which is sometimes surprising, and how their joint pain starts, how it heals, why it sometimes doesn't, and then what can be done to treat it safely and effectively at the core. And it's crazy to hear myself say it now, but I have decades now of knowledge from studying both the published research and the science in the medical journals and studying in the real world with real people, many of whom are just like you. And I've learned a whole lot in that time. I hope that I have earned your trust with this story that I just told you. And now we can get into the details. So I want you to feel better. I want to help you do that. So let's rock and roll. Maybe you've been given a diagnosis for your condition. Maybe it has a name. Maybe you've been given a referral for an imaging study like an x-ray or an MRI or to another specialist. It's possible you've been given a prescription medication to treat your symptoms, but I'm guessing that there is one thing that you've never been given, and that is a complete understanding of what is actually causing your pain. I mean, the real, true, underlying cause of that pain, the the, the cause that needs to be addressed in order for you to get out of that pain and get back to living your best life. And by the end of this episode, you will understand why you hurt. You'll hopefully be able to take back control over those true underlying causes, and you'll learn exactly how to use that control to end your pain, hopefully permanently. And one of the coolest things about this format is that you don't need to be a patient of mine at my office here in Connecticut to get access to this information because I'm sharing the secret sauce. I'm sharing my whole recipe right here with you today. And it's the same recipe that has helped thousands of patients through the years, but this time it's here on the show for you and I love it. So at this point in my career, getting this information into the hands of as many people as possible, it's really my mission. It's my North Star and it's become an obsession because I am a sensitive person and I hate to see people suffering, especially when that suffering is unnecessary. And while we're on the subject of unnecessary suffering, I have seen countless people who have had unnecessary surgeries, and those should never happen, but they do happen hundreds of thousands of times per year. And then, of course, there is this unnecessary suffering of the millions and millions of people who become dependent or addicted on uh, to medications. It's a familiar story, often with a very tragic ending, and that is what this is all about, ending that suffering, by ending the pain. So let's dig in and get started. So the first part of this is that I'm gonna walk you through a diagram as an exercise that's gonna help you identify the true source of your pain. And then I'm gonna take you through solutions to help relieve that pain by treating it 
at the source. So for those of you who are watching this on video, you're going to see that diagram here. And if you're just listening as in a podcast, don't worry, I will talk you right through it. This is the pain matrix diagram that I developed. We are looking at a simple framework that's the result of all of those years observing pain patterns. And it's what I call the pain matrix. And this, I think, is where this, the whole story gets really, really interesting. So as you can see, or I'll describe for you, there are four main sources that lead to pain. Starting with number one, injury. Number two, inflammation, number three, muscle tension, and number four, fibrosis. Now, each one of those little boxes at the top of the diagram all have little arrows coming out of them pointing towards pain, and we are going to explore each one of them now. So going through each element of this matrix in detail is going to help you understand your own unique painful problem, and I'm confident that understanding it in this way is going to give you insights about your pain that you never heard of or even thought of before. So let's Let's take a deeper dive into each element of this pain matrix cycle. We'll first look at the sources and then we will dive in to the solutions. So the first source is injury and you can follow along with me here. You're sure to relate to one of the following types of injury or the trauma that played a role in the origination of your pain. And there's several different types of injury. The first is acute injuries. And this is the first and most obvious type of trauma or injury. It's called acute trauma. And there's no, really no mystery here. If you've had an acute trauma, you know it and you know it immediately. You can pinpoint the exact moment that you got hurt, a torn ACL on the soccer field, for example, or other common acute traumatic injuries, sprains, strains, ruptures, fractures, herniations, dislocations. These injuries happen in an instant and they can often, unfortunately, lead to pain for life if they're not managed correctly. So those are acute injuries. Now we have subacute injuries. That's the next type of trauma. And subacute injuries refer to when you can't really pinpoint that exact moment, but you know roughly when you got hurt. Uh, around here in Connecticut, it might be shoveling snow in the winter. It could be a fender bender. It didn't seem too bad at the time, but then your back or your neck started to hurt in the next day or two. And these subacute injuries are really tricky because at the time of the injury, you may not even notice that you're hurt until days later the pain can become unbearable. So that's subacute injuries. And then the third type is chronic. You've heard the word before, and chronic injuries are super sneaky. These are sneaky because there's no real moment of injury. Instead, chronic trauma is a pattern of much smaller, repetitive micro injuries that cause damage slowly. And this can happen over months or even years. Things like poor posture, repetitive athletic motions, golf swings, tennis swings, even simple daily activities of living like driving a car, typing, texting these days, washing dishes, cleaning around the house. Those can lead to chronic chronic micro injuries that develop into chronic pain syndromes. So all of it starts with injury, acute, subacute, or chronic. Hopefully you're with me there. Now, from there, it's pretty obvious what's going to happen next. Injury causes damage to tissue, regardless of the type of injury. And in the case of musculoskeletal pain, we're talking about damage to connective tissue. And that's named for its function. It connects and supports. It basically holds us together. Now, classic examples of the connective tissues are bones, ligaments, tendons, cartilage. They form the joints, in many cases, that are giving you so much trouble. So when connective tissue gets damaged, no matter how it happens, the body reacts with a very sophisticated and extremely useful biological response. It's kind of like a, a biological first responder team. And that first response process is something that you've definitely heard of before. It's also something that your doctor has given you drugs to suppress. Anyone know what this is called? Quick quiz. It's the source number two, and it's inflammation. So we're going to talk about inflammation now. So You've undoubtedly learned from your doctor and from countless commercials and advertisements for drugs that inflammation is a bad thing and that it needs to be stopped or suppressed at all costs. But that is not true. As you've just learned, inflammation is your response to tissue injury. It's how your body heals. It's only when inflammation is excessive, when it's out of control, that it becomes a destructive force. So our job is not 
to simply suppress it, but to use tools and strategies to help control and contain it so that it can help you heal. Now, there's an interesting little side note here. Inflammation is named after fire. It even has the word flame in the word. And much like fire, if it's controlled, it's not only safe, but it's necessary. But also just like fire, when it's out of control, it can be incredibly destructive. Now, for many of you, there are reasons why your inflammation is out of control. And like I said, when that happens, it can be like a wildfire and it destroys everything in its path in your body. And if that's what's happening, just like a firefighter, we need to treat both the fire and the terrain. In this case, that terrain is your body. Now, Big Pharma and modern medicine is dead set on suppressing inflammation. And there's many drugs that attempt to just put out the fire entirely. But because, as I said, inflammation is an essential biological process. You can't just shut it down without consequences. And that is why all of those anti-inflammatory medications have so many side effects. And often the side effects of suppressing inflammation are worse than the problem that they are designed to treat. So the goal should be to control and contain inflammation, not to turn it off completely because inflammation is a biological chain reaction. You can think of it a lot like maybe be like the postal service, except instead of delivering mail, the immune system is sending messages with instructions for how to respond to injury. And the content inside those cellular messages is all these fancy sounding chemicals. I'll spare you the details, things like cytokines and interleukins. Those contain the instructions for the recipient, for the receiver. And the mailboxes where those get delivered they're called receptors, and they are sitting anchored inside of the membranes, the outer membranes of your cells. And the reason why I'm mentioning the cell membrane right now is because when those receptors are anchored into a healthy cell membrane, those mailboxes are anchored properly, and that cell membrane is made of high-quality building materials, they work better. And in terms of inflammation, that means it stays controlled. Like the fire stays in the fireplace or the fire pit to keep you warm. It doesn't escape and burn down the house. The cell membrane is critical to inflammation control process. So another quick quiz here. Does anybody out there know what cell membranes are made of? Here's the answer. They are made of fat, F-A-T, literally. The fats and the oils that you eat get digested, absorbed, incorporated into your cell membranes. And I want you to remember that because it's going to be on another pop quiz in just a few minutes. Healthy cell membranes are critical for inflammation control. And cell membranes are made of fat. Hopefully, you've got that now. Now, when inflammation is raging and out of control, it creates all sorts of other problems as well. And one of the most important is that inflammation is associated with swelling and the accumulation of fluid and swelling in an area that's already fairly tightly packed. Now that swelling, all that extra material puts pressure on those tissues, especially the sensitive nerve endings that are in and around any of your joints. And the end result of that, just like the arrow shows, is pain. Now, the other thing that happens when you're dealing with pain from excessive inflammation is that you get tension in the muscles in and around that area. And that brings us to source number three. Source number three of pain, true underlying causes, is muscular tension. So let's take a look at a low back injury, for example. Maybe you heard it playing golf or tennis or pickleball these days with everybody's playing. Um, or maybe it's an old injury, never quite healed properly. No matter how it happened or when it happened, if moving some part of your body is causing you pain, you will naturally change the way you move to protect yourself, to prevent more pain and to protect your back or your knee or whatever joint it is. Now, you might notice that you're hunched forward or you're bent to the side or both of those things. And that bend or that twist was not caused by the injury. It was caused by the muscular tension as a response to the injury. Now, most people do this totally unconsciously, but if you continue in that abnormal posture or that asymmetrical posture, it changes your biomechanics. It can restrict blood supply. It can pinch nerves. It can cause even more damage and add a whole new layer of stress and pain to the system. Now, this is extremely common that the muscle tension that happens as a response to the injury and the inflammation causes more pain than the injury itself. And even worse than that, when the tension persists over extended periods, like months to years, 
even decades in some cases, it sets the stage for the final source, the fourth source, which is called fibrosis. So fibrosis, I imagine most of you have never heard this word before, but you definitely know what it is. So fibrosis refers to the accumulation of a substance called fibrin in tissue, and fibrin is what scars are made out of. So fibrin accumulates where there has been injury, inflammation, and muscle tension in an area. Those first three things lead to the development of fibrosis. Okay, now this is going to sound kind of weird, but I want you to think for a minute about two different steaks, steak for dinner tonight. One of them is super tender, like a filet mignon, and the other is a flank steak. It's tough and it's chewy. Now, when a muscle that is supposed to be tender is in an area where there's excessive inflammation and excessive tension, that muscle becomes fibrotic, like a tough chewy piece of meat. And if that tough, chewy muscle is in your back or it's near your painful knee or your hip or wherever the case may be, the joint will be more stiff. It'll be more sore and it will give you even more pain. Hey, if you like what you are hearing on the show today, stay in touch. You can do that as easy as sending a quick text that says P-O-D to this number, 51472. And that will allow you to join the What's Your Medicine community. Text P-O-D to 51472 right now and we'll jump back into the show. Okay, so we got through that framework of sources of your pain. Hopefully you're with me. Hopefully you learned something. And now that you have a better understanding of the sources of your pain, what's causing it, let's get into the solutions. I am ready and I'm sure you are too. So at this point, we've arrived at the point in the episode where I'm going to talk to you about naturopathic solutions. And that is really what I'm sure most of you are here for. I'm sure you're ready and I am too. So you might be wondering, how is he going to talk about solutions when every one of the hundreds or hopefully thousands or even millions of people who are watching this right now have pain that's in a different place, right? Some of you have sciatica, others have arthritis in a knee or in a hip or in both. I mean, there's hundreds of possible diagnosis in musculoskeletal medicine or orthopedics, and every case of joint pain requires a different solution, right? Well, let me answer that question. And to do it, I'd like to bring you back to my days as a young medical intern rotating through those sports medicine and orthopedic clinics that I told you about. You can imagine the scene in these places. This is a busy clinic, long hallway, exam rooms along the hallway, one after the other. You can almost hear the physician's assistant saying, there's a lumbar disc herniation in room number one, uh, rotator cuff tear in room two, bone on bone knee arthritis in room three. You can, you can picture that, right? So now, after more than 20 years in clinical practice, I have never seen a lumbar spine or a knee or a shoulder or any other body part come waltzing into my office. Those joints always have been attached to a person. And it's a person who has a body, a mind, a spirit, a family, a job, a diet, and a lifestyle that is unique to them. So let's go back to the question. Doesn't every case of joint pain require a different solution? Well, the answer to that is yes, but also no. Like I said, joint pain always occurs in people. And there are four fundamental pillars that exert a huge influence over how people with joint pain handle and recover from the injuries, the inflammation, the muscle tension, and the fibrosis. So let's take a look at these solutions. So there are several parts of this solutions framework that apply to everyone, no matter where it hurts. And the first three elements that we're going to talk about here are exactly like that. They apply to everyone. There is a best diet for people with joint pain, no matter where it hurts. There are best lifestyle practices for people with joint pain, no matter where it hurts. And there are best herbal and nutritional supplements for people with joint pain, no matter where it hurts. So in terms of those three parts of this solutions framework that I'm about to discuss with you now, they are basically universal. They can be applied to anybody who has joint pain. And if they're done in a way that I'm gonna lay out for you here, they will effectively help to manage, treat each one of those four sources of your pain that we talked about earlier. So let me give you just a few examples to illustrate the point about how these three solutions can treat the entire whole person 
in whom that painful area resides. And then we'll get into the fourth solution as well, and that's where things get sort of specific, unique, and really individualized. So let's start with solution number one, and that is diet. We all can agree that food is medicine, right? So in the diet category, my goal here today in this episode is not to put you on a diet, but to explain to you how your food choices can really be a game changer for your joint pain. And to illustrate that, I'm going to tell you another story. I love stories about one of my patients. So her name's Helene. And when I met her over five years ago, she was 55. She was about 40 pounds heavier than she wanted to be or than, she, than, than was her ideal weight. And she was suffering from terrible pain from osteoarthritis in both of her knees. She had already had multiple steroid injections on each side. And she was told by a surgeon that she should try to lose some weight and that whenever she was ready, he was going to do surgery to replace her knees, one and then the other. And now she wanted to avoid that, and that's the reason why she came to me. So I laid out what I call a comfort foods dietary plan. I call them comfort foods because eating this way is like comfort foods because they're yummy, but it also makes your body, and in Helene's case, her knees, more comfortable. And that's the best part about it. So she trusted me, and she, this woman really leaned into it. She did what I call an oil change, where we swapped out all of the bad fats that were damaging her cell membranes. Remember, we were talking about how cell membranes are made of fat, and those bad fats that she was eating were letting her inflammation burn out of control. She cut out highly processed foods. She started looking carefully at ingredients in the food she was eating. She started eating in a simple, down-to-earth kind of way, eating mostly foods from the perimeter of the grocery store, the foods that look the way that they did when they came off the farm or out of the fields or out of the, the fisheries. And that meant cutting out a lot of the things that health she called health foods that she thought were healthy, but were actually making her worse. She felt full even on less calories because the food she was eating were so nutrient dense. And then six weeks later, I wrote these exact notes in her chart. Number one, bilateral knee OA, that stands for osteoarthritis. Pain significantly reduced, now two out of 10, was seven out of 10 at last office visit. Back to regular walking, average three miles daily, was able to discontinue RX, prescription meloxicam, and reports no longer using over-the-counter NSAIDs. Amazing. Her weight, down 16 pounds with these diet changes, increased physical activity since her last office visit. So, the thing I want you to realize here is that the specific diet changes I recommended for Helene, they are not a knee pain diet. She got pain relief and she also lost weight because she learned how to use food as medicine. And I imagine that that sounds good to you, right? So the, the details of exactly which foods to eat, which foods to avoid is more detailed than I'm able to cover here on this episode right here, right now. But I do have tons of specific anti-inflammatory food guidance and content for you. Just subscribe to this channel on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform. We will stay in touch. You can also follow me on Instagram or TikTok. I cover nutrition and anti-inflammatory eating there all the time. And you can find me on both of those platforms at, at that little at symbol, Dr. Josh Levitt, D-R-J-O-S-H-L-E-V-I-T-T. -T. And I promise you that anti-inflammatory eating can be simple, inexpensive, and delicious. Okay, we have arrived at solution number two, and that is lifestyle. Now, I don't think I mentioned it earlier, but I live right near Yale University. And in the last 10 or 12 years or so, I have been honored to be able to have Yale medical residents rotate with me to learn about my approach at my office. And this is very, very different from what they learn in their usual rotations with specialists at the at the hospital. So lots of my friends here in Connecticut are Yale doctors. And these days, it seems almost like medical specialists are getting more and more specialized. Like it used to be that there were orthopedists who saw people with joint pain. And then it got more narrow. We had spine doctors. We have upper extremity doctors. We have lower extremity doctors. And now we've got different specialists for shoulders, elbows, wrists, hands. I even had a patient recently who saw a specialist in thumbs. He had a real severe thumb problem. And now, listen, I'm not knocking it because if you have a serious thumb problem, seeing a doctor who is a specialist in thumbs can be great. But what tends to happen as we narrow in on an area like that, it's really easy to lose sight of the bigger picture there. So you probably heard the saying before, you can't see the forest for the trees. And when it comes to lifestyle medicine, it's imperative that we look at the health of that entire forest. And that's why it's so important that if you have joint pain, your lifestyle 
And what I mean by lifestyle is about your habits, your stress and how you manage that stress, your sleep, your social life, the human connections in your life, your community, even the lens through which you see the world. All of these components have a huge impact on the way that your body handles injury, inflammation, muscle tension, fibrosis, and and recovery. So On this show and in my newsletters on my social media channels, I talk about lifestyle medicine a lot and I get into the details of all the sorts of different specific lifestyle modifications. But for right now, let me just give you one simple, concrete, and I think truly awesome example of how this can work. So medical research has known for a long time that positive emotions are good for your health. And that makes sense, right? Carrying around a lot of negative emotions like loneliness, fear, anger, those sorts of things is associated with negative health effects. And that includes increased pain, but experiencing positive emotions, things like gratitude, compassion, love, joy, those are associated with lower disease risk and correlated with lower levels of inflammation and pain. Now, it's interesting, but honestly, not a huge surprise for anyone who thinks about health in a holistic kind of way. So this is where things get really awesome. So researchers at Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley in California, designed a study to figure out of all of those different positive emotions that we have, which one has the greatest impact on markers of inflammation in the blood. Turns out that of all the different positive emotions, the one that is most strongly associated with lower levels of inflammation was awe, A-W-E. The more you experience awe, the better you will feel. It's a beautiful thing, and it's so easy to put this in practice as lifestyle medicine. This does not need to be a big, profound thing. It can be anything, something in nature, in art, in science, in, in music, in people, even the food that you're eating, technology. When you start to look and tune into things that are awesome around you, you start to see it everywhere. And when you do that, it can make a really powerful difference in your life by by changing your frame of reference, which we all know has a huge influence on your health, in your body, in your mind, and in your spirit. And that is exactly the sort of stuff that I just love about lifestyle medicine. I promise you, we are going to explore lifestyle medicine a bunch more and all sorts of cool lifestyle stuff on this show with lots more examples to come. So I'll look forward to sharing those with you. Now let's move on to solution number three, and that is supplements. So you remember my story a minute ago about that grisly tough flank steak from from a few minutes ago. If you're a chef and you've got that flank steak, what's the solution? So the first part of this is to use that meat tenderizing hammer. It mechanically breaks up the gristle. You pound on it and it softens, breaks up the fiber mechanically. And it works, but it works even better if you sprinkle meat tenderizer on the steak first. Now, why is that? So take a close look at meat tenderizer and you'll see that the active ingredient in it is something called bromelain. Now, bromelain is a natural compound. It's found in pineapples, which is anti-fibrotic. It means it breaks up fiber and it breaks up the gristle and it makes the meat softer and more tender, whether it's in a steak in your kitchen or in your body. Now, this is the mind blowing part of this. When taken as a supplement, pharmaceutical grade bromelain, it does the exact same thing. It breaks up scar tissue, it tenderizes muscles, and it helps people with joint pain feel better. And that is just bromelain, one dietary supplement that you can take. And there's lots of other natural ingredients that are useful for people with joint pain too. Now, of course, as a person myself who developed one of the best-selling natural products in the joint pain category, I have my biases and I am going to share my list of top natural and herbal ingredients with you right now. Consider the fact that I am biased, but I'm biased for a pretty good reason. Bromelain, that is the natural antifibrotic enzyme. I just talked about it uh, that comes from pineapple. Number two, curcumin, and that is a golden molecule. It really is a gold color that's found in turmeric, the root of the turmeric plant, and it has powerful effects on the biochemistry of inflammation, and there is mountains of research that demonstrates curcumin's benefit for people with inflammation and with pain. Number three is quercetin with a Q. Quercetin is a bioflavonoid molecule, and it's found in onions and a a number of other vegetables and fruits. It's a potent antioxidant compound, and it's been shown in numerous studies to improve inflammation and improve pain in people who have arthritis. 
Number four is boswellia. Boswellia is an herbal medicine, and it's made from a dried sap. It's like a resin from a plant that's known as frankincense. You've probably heard of that before, uh, and it has anti-inflammatory effects. And there's even some evidence that boswellia can improve the integrity of the cartilage surfaces that are inside arthritic joints. It's also been compared head-to-head against pharmaceuticals and shown to be equal or even more beneficial, of course, with less side effects. Number five, magnesium, probably my favorite mineral. And I know that's a nerdy thing to say, but it's true because so many of us are deficient in magnesium for a number of different reasons. One, we don't eat enough of the nutritious whole foods that contain magnesium. Number two, the soil that we grow our foods in, it's been depleted. And number three, stress causes us to use up more magnesium. And because magnesium is needed for muscles to be healthy and relaxed, supplementing with it, can help work wonders for painful joints by helping relax that muscle tension piece that we identified as a source. And number six, the last one, uh, I would put collagen peptides on the list. Now, collagen is the main protein in connective tissue, bones, ligaments, tendons, muscles, the stuff that holds us together. And that's why consuming collagen peptides helps to improve the, the structural integrity of those tissues, and it helps so many people feel better. So those are my top six in the supplement category. I recommend them routinely. I've formulated products with them for many, many years, and I know that when people use these things together, they represent the most effective nutritional and herbal medicines to target the injury, the inflammation, the muscular tension, and the fibrosis that is causing your pain. So now let's move on to the last solution. And this is an interesting one. The solution is called movement. Movement is medicine. Hopefully now you have a sense of how those first three, the diet, the lifestyle, the supplements, they have whole body effects. They work on the pain by working on the person who has the pain. But the last solution, it's a little different because it needs to be directed right at where it hurts. Now, I don't know exactly where you're hurting, and this show is probably not the time or the place for me to be teaching you specific movements. So I'm going to speak generally here, and I'm going to ask again that you like and subscribe to this channel on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform. Be, feel free to comment below this video about where you have pain. We can stay in touch about that, and I can share more content, specific content with you in those ways. Of course, you can also follow me on Instagram and TikTok. I'll share even more there for you as well. So it's possible that you could have pain anywhere or everywhere, your neck, your shoulders, upper back, lower back, hips, knees, elbows, wrists, hands, your feet, no matter where it hurts, there is another framework. And this framework includes four, I think, really simple movements that apply. So let's, let's paddle on over to those four simple movements right now. A lot of you are thinking, if you, if you heard me correctly, did I just say paddle on over into these four steps? Indeed, I did say paddle on over. You remember towards the beginning of this, uh, of this episode, I told you that surfing, surfing on waves, not surfing on the internet, was part of my life growing up. And the truth is that that hasn't changed a lot. I'm still a surfer. I intend to keep surfing as long as my body allows me to do it, which for now, I'm grateful, is still going strong. So let's go back to those four simple movements that I'm talking about. So it turns out, thankfully for me, that when you put together the first letter of each one of the types of movements in the right order, it spells out one of my very favorite words, and that word is surf, S-U-R-F. And when you do these four movements for your painful area the right way, in the right order, they can help to get rid of that pain as using movement as medicine. So like I said before, this episode is not the place to demonstrate each one of these specific movements for every body area that would take a long time, but it's a perfect place to cover the generalities of these surf movements, how they work and how they can help you. So let's get into that. The S in the S-U-R-F framework stands for stretching. Now, this is your warm-up. These are simple stretches that should feel good to do. They help to loosen and lengthen shortened muscles, and they help to identify hot spots, what we call trigger points. And that is important for the next step, which is the U, which is unlocking. So I, didn't, I don't think I talked about this earlier, but the tension that develops in muscles, it can involve the whole muscle from end to end, 
or it can involve just a small area within that muscle. And that's what a lot of people call a knot. Now, technically in medicine, those knots are called trigger points. And these unlocking techniques that you can use will help to untie those knots. Now, once the trigger points and that tension has been released, we can move on to the R in S-U-R-F, and that stands for resistance training, really important. For muscles to get stronger, they need to do work against resistance. And we now know that having stronger muscles is critical to support joints and stabilize them. So these resistance movements are designed to build that strength without risking injury. Now, the best part about strength training exercises is that they can be done by anyone. It doesn't matter how advanced or severe your joint pain might be. And I have another story about that for you in a few minutes. But for now, let's let's just keep on surfing here. The F, the last letter in the word surf, stands for functional movements. Functional movement is the medical term for real world situational biomechanics, twisting a lid off a pickle jar, getting into or out of a car, the sorts of things that joint joint pain can often make impossible. Now, learning and practicing these practical functional movements is a shortcut to getting your pain-free life back. So there you have it. You control the inflammation, you reduce the muscle tension, you break down the fibrosis, and you do the S-U-R-F, stretching, unlocking, resistance training, and functional movements every single day. That is exactly the sort of plan that you would get if you came and saw me in my office. I hope today that I was able to make it clear that my medicine for joint pain is different than the drugs, the injections, and the surgeries that are just par for the course out there these days. And at this point, if you're anything like any of the thousands of patients that I've seen who have joint pain or arthritis, you might even have a question. And the question would be, why hasn't my doctor ever mentioned any of this to me? Now, unfortunately, the answer really is an indictment of the modern medical industry model. It's just not a health care system. It's a pharmacosurgical disease care system. It's focused on the use of drugs and surgeries for symptom relief. And that is fine when it's needed, but that's entirely different than focusing on the things that promote health, like hopefully we did here today. And a case in point here is the millions and millions of people who take pain medications and anti-inflammatories, which do nothing to address the underlying problem that created that pain in the first place. So there you have it. I know I covered a ton of information today. And I know also that sometimes that can feel like the dog that caught the car. I love that metaphor. Like I knew I wanted it, but now what do I do now that I have it? Well, the answer to that question is to subscribe to this channel on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform and stay in touch. And please send in your comments, your questions, any ideas that you might have for topics that you want me to cover on the show. I have some really great shows coming up for you in the next few weeks with amazing experts that you will not want to miss. Viruses as medicine. I know it sounds like science fiction, but it is real and it is happening now. Mushrooms as medicine. They are exploding in popularity these days and so much more. It's going to be a good time. So I'm Dr. Josh and I will see you next week with another episode of What's Your Medicine?